Good morning and welcome to the WellMed Charitable Foundation Caregiver Teleconnection Series. Today we have planning for the holidays with Lucy and Elliot, dear Lucy and our wonderful Elliot. I'm going to tell you a little bit about them. Dr. Elliot Montgomery Sklar is a public health professional focused upon supporting the health of the public through academic work, research, and service. He has led healthy aging programs for seniors and for caregivers in Canada, Florida, and virtually. Dr. Sklar is an associate professor of healthcare sciences at Nova Southeastern University in Florida. He publishes and presents his work internationally, which is focused on the complexity of issues related to aging and caregiving. Lucy Berlach received her master's degree in social work from McGill University. She's dedicated her career to supporting caregivers. She was the founder and long-term manager of the Caregiver Support Center at a respite program for family caregivers. In 2003 and 2012, she received the Queen's Jubilee Award presented by the Canadian Home Care Association, awarded for her dedication in developing a national coalition to support caregivers. Ms. Barely also co-edited a book for healthcare professionals called Responding Creatively to the Needs of Caregivers. She's been a key architect of screening and assessment tools of family caregivers for professionals across North America. Lucy consults for private industry, including WellMed Charitable Foundation and clinics in Texas. And with that, please tell us how to plan for the holidays. Thank you so much, Evelyn and Minerva. Yes, today the topic is planning for the holidays. What I also want to tell you is that we will, after the session is over, we will stay on for an additional half hour. We'll close the recording and anybody can ask any questions or make any comments. So the holiday time. For some caregivers, the holidays can feel even more isolating or more stressful. So this program will focus on those emotions and will examine some practical ways to make this a wonderful holiday season. However, for many caregivers, the holiday season gives, to, gives rise to stress, frustration, sadness, anger, instead of peace and joy. Managing care for someone who has a cognitive impairment may leave caregivers feeling that they will not be able to participate as fully as they would like in family gatherings. Already feeling overwhelmed with caregiving tasks, stressed out caregivers may view traditional holiday preparation as more of a drain of precious energy than of joy. Where did the year go? My goodness, I can't believe that we're talking about the holidays already. Yes. I was speaking with a caregiver yesterday, actually, who had said that she missed COVID at this time of the year because it gave her the one thing that she looked back upon fondly from COVID was that as a caregiver, it relieved her of the stress around the holidays. And I thought that that was such an interesting observation to hear from somebody because we most of us don't really look back at that time <clears throat> very fondly, but many of us connected over FaceTime or Zoom to be able to celebrate holidays together in a way that was um, easier for many caregivers. So I think one of the most difficult parts about the holidays really, um, and I think this is true for caregivers and for all of us, is reconciling our expectations with realities. Now, the holidays are marketed as the most wonderful time of the year, but that isn't really true for everyone, and nor is it going to be the most wonderful time of the year every year consistently. In fact, the holiday season can be the hardest time of the year. We may not have the relationships that we wished for, and spending time with family can be challenging and triggering. Also, rather than seeing the wonder in everything, it can be a time in which we see some dysfunction. We may feel pressure having to do things that we don't really want to do or with people that we don't want to do things with um, that can even extend to work holiday parties. There's an added level of stress too around travel, which is something that not a lot of people talk about when we address preparing for the holidays with caregivers. And we're going to talk a lot about that actually during our presentation today. So I think that for many caregivers, as I said, the holiday can signal a time of reflection. 
um, because our expectations of what we wanted our life to look like or what we had envisioned life to look like for our care recipients can be quite a bit different than reality. Um, and Eric asked if I could speak a little louder, and I certainly will. Um, I hope this is better. Um, <clears throat> I do also have my mic up to the highest volume. So I wanted to turn it over to our participants today and to hear from you what you are least looking forward to about the holidays. You can enter something in the chat or you can feel free to unmute. And I do have this website and I would love to have folks who are on the phone, please go ahead also and just press star six. Or if you're on Zoom, just open up your, um, your speaker or put your hand up or use the chat room. Think about it. You know, it's a question that most people don't get asked, but I think it's an important one for us to consider. So LaTanya said, I love the hustle and bustle, but it gives me anxiety. I completely understand that. It's a very busy time of the year. And I think also for caregivers, there's the added um, awareness since COVID of the extra people around, precautions, and so on. So I get that very much. I know for myself and a lot of people, we experience deaths or sorrows during holidays. And that always makes it a little tough. Absolutely. And yeah. Sorry. Ahead, sorry. No, I'm just saying I was thinking of myself and like every year I, I I host quite a few people and I'm just saying to myself, am I able to do that this year? <laughs> do I have the energy uh, to do that? So there's always mixed feelings, aren't there? Minerva just brought something up that I was going to also address. With the prices of food still up, it's the stress of coming up with meal plans for get-togethers. It's a great point. And um, for those of you who have access to a local Target store, they just announced that they'll be doing holiday meals for $25. Um, that includes your sides, your turkey, um, everything, because so many people are struggling with being able to afford uh, meals for the, <clears throat> I'm sorry, for the holidays. Cool. Yeah. Anything else? Before we move forward, I think Evelyn, you brought up a great point. There are um, losses that we mourn during the holidays and wish that there are people that could still be with us to celebrate. And I think at times if we're providing care and we see that a loved one's health is declining, that's also very triggering and can be very difficult to process, certainly. So let's flip this around. What are you most looking forward to about the holidays? Because we want to focus on the positives, but we have to get the negatives out of the way first. So if you're on, on the phone, please just press star six. Otherwise, open up your line. We'd love to hear from you. Sorry, I had to get Herbie. He was trying to jump up. <laughs> I am most looking forward to spending time with him this holiday. <laughs> Do you actually get some time off? This is your only time of year you get off, right? <clears throat> yes, actually, the Christmas season is the only time when I am not teaching all year. Wow. Well, you're really looking forward to it. <laughs> Minerva said that she most enjoys the scent of cinnamon everywhere and the decoration. And Latanya said family gatherings, decorations, and the hustle and bustle. So it, it gives you anxiety in a positive way, perhaps, too. Interesting. The decorations are always something I look forward to. It's a very beautiful, pretty time of the year. And we tried to incorporate some of that into our presentation deck today. And I see we have another chat comment. Making new memories with our grown children. I love that, Joanne. That's so nice. For sure. It's a time of the year when some people also like to make photo books um, with their memories that they continue to create 
And that's a great thing for people with dementia and Alzheimer's as well. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that later. So let's move forward. Okay, so, you know, it was interesting to hear the positives and the negatives. Um, but let's look at some of the key strategies for managing the holidays as a caregiver. And one of the most important is really setting realistic expectations, understanding that your loved one's condition may affect their ability to participate or understand holiday festivals as they used to. So what we're actually saying is to accept them for who they are now and what they're capable of. Embrace the idea that different doesn't mean worse. Adapt traditions to fit their current abilities and comfort level, very much what Elliot said, to make new memories. Now, this is a really important one. Seek help. Reach out to family members and friends for assistance. Consider hiring a professional caregiver if, if you're able to do so, especially during the holidays to allow you some time off to enjoy the season. Now, this one, planning ahead, create a detailed schedule for the holiday period because we know that people with dementia really do well on a schedule, include daily routines, meal times, and any planned activities. You know, so that's having a structured plan can help reduce confusion and anxiety for your loved one. You really have to take that into consideration because we know anything that kind of changes can trigger more confusion. More confusion. Now, keeping it simple, I think simple is good. You know, minimize clutter and decoration, excessive decoration can overwhelm and confuse individuals with dementia. And it's important to create a calm and safe environment to prevent agitation. So even though we love a lot, a lot of decorations all over the place, know where the person you're caring for is coming from. If you start, if you see that they're really anxious about what's going on, then limit a little bit. Now, this one, self-care should be your priority because if you don't have self-care, you can't take care of anybody else or even enjoy yourself. Prioritize your, your well-being. Schedule major breaks and downtime to rest and recharge. I do a lot of that. I cook and then I go over, I rest a little bit, go back. It's important. Take time for yourself. Maybe, you know, maybe time alone. Being around many people during the holidays can feel overwhelming at times, especially if you're a person who likes a little bit of privacy. If possible, delegate some caregiving responsibility to others, allowing you to participate in self-care activities. And that's really a really important thing to do. And you know, Holly, yes, go ahead. I was just going to say that you brought up a really good point that people don't think of when it comes to decoration. It's something that we talk about during our disaster preparedness tips for caregivers, but flashlights, flashing lights can be very frightening for people with Alzheimer's and dementia. And we don't recognize often that Christmas tree lights that flash can have that same impact. So it's a very good point. Yes, especially if they get up at night, you know, and the Christmas lights are on and they might not even remember what this is all about. It can be frightening. So as we said, Know the person that you're caring for. If you see that happening, just make it a little bit more simple. You know, holidays can be a time to educate and communicate about your experience as a caregiver and about the person to whom you are caring for. Now, that doesn't mean it has to be a downer, you know, when you're, you know, you, you're just, it's a good time when family gets together to talk to your family and friends about the illness that your care recipient has its effects and your loved one's specific needs and preferences. Because some of you, some of the people, you don't see them maybe throughout the year and they don't really have a good understanding of where that person is at right now. So being open so that they don't get disappointed or concerned so they know what's going on. Open communication can help others understand your caregivers, challenge, your, care, your caregiving challenges and offer meaningful support. You know, it's hard to know how much to communicate, what should you say, how much to reveal, but I think you need to tell them enough so they have a pretty good idea 
of what you're going through and what the person that you are caring for is going through as well. You know, the other thing is that um, sharing the truth of your situation may help reduce some of the feelings of isolation and lack of gratitude common in caregivers so that others know exactly what you're going on. Focus on the positive moments you share with your loved one during the holidays. Express gratitude for the opportunity to make memories, even if you if they are different from past celebrations. By implementing these strategies, you can help ensure that both you and your loved one with dementia have a more manageable and meaningful holiday season. Remember that flexibility, patience, and self-care are key to navigating this challenging but important uh, journey. And even, I'll go as far as saying, even preparation, things need to be simple. Don't overburden yourself with cooking or baking. Ask others to help as well. Actually, it'll make it very interesting when people do bring um, different recipes or different foods to the table. So these are some of the strategies, and I hope that um, if anyone has any others that you would like to share at this point, please feel free. Good. There is Evelyn. <laughs> <laughs> I felt here. I felt you had something to say. <laughs> Well, as everyone knows, I am the queen of long-term care planning. <laughs> and I think this is a really, you know, when you do get together face-to-face -to -face with family, it's an excellent time to either work on a long-term care plan or to update your long-term care plan because it changes so frequently. And, and, and timely, I will be giving um, a talk on the, November 28th on the teleconnection session that really talks very specifically about what you need to make as part of your long-term care plan, the kinds of decisions, the kinds of conversations you need to have with family, with lawyers, with financial people, you know, with everyone, the doctors, the people who are intimately involved in the care of your loved one and of you, because who knows who's going first. We need to, we need to plan for the end of our life. And, and if we have a plan, make sure there's a lot of fun in it and a lot of joy. Thank you so, for that, Evelyn. Evelyn, I have a question for you. Um, this is a great conversation and great points that you brought up. We had a participant in one of our programs last week, I believe, or the week prior, who was saying that she was going to use Thanksgiving as the opportunity to discuss um, uh, arrangements and final wishes for her and her family. Mm -hmm. And we had said, maybe don't do that for Thanksgiving and hold off and do that right after Thanksgiving, um, but enjoy the time together. So for someone who is planning to broach these things at the holidays, how would you suggest that they go about it? Because it can be a little off-putting for people that are coming and thinking that they're going to be celebrating and and not necessarily um, addressing things that are so difficult. Well, I can tell you um, one of the techniques that I really like, we had a, uh, we, there's a podcast and it's called Planning for the End of Life. And it was a, a very brilliant woman who works for HPI, I think, which is a health promotion institute. And what it really said was, hey, here's a list of all the things you might want to think about, you know, when you want to talk, you know, to people that you love about end of life care. And it was all very positive. It wasn't about death. It was about planning for how you want to, you know, what you want, you know, and, his, and I sent it to my family, you know, and they were great. You know, so I, I think that's a positive thing to do is to get that list and I can put a link to that on our uh, resources for today. That, that would because be great. It was, cool. it was cool. It was like five pages. You know, it was actually, you could print it out and use it as the form for yourself, print, you know, if copies out for your family, you know, and just say, hey, this is something to think about as we get together and maybe after thanks, you know, the day after or something, we can sit down and talk about it and make some plans. 
I, I love that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, uh, you talked about resources. For everyone who signed up for our program today, you will get a copy of a handout. And you may want to print this little caption here on the slide, because I think that it's an important thing to remember over the holiday season. Express gratitude, exert flexibility, and exercise patience. Well said. We all need that during the holidays and all throughout the year. Um, something else that I want to talk about is a different kind of R and R around the holidays. We think of whoops, we think of R and R as rest and relaxation, but today we're going to talk about respite and routine. Um, Lucy had said that another major challenge for many caregivers at this time of the year is being able to follow routine. And if you think about it, many people who rely upon paid help, aids, or adult day centers, the holidays can certainly cause a shift in that routine. Things close, staffing is not always up to par around the holidays, paid caregivers may be spending time with their families too. So there's an additional stress in all of that. And again, planning is so important. You know, this is where other friends and family at this time of the year can come in in a very helpful way. It's really important for people with Alzheimer's and dementia and their caregivers to recognize that ma maintaining routines as much as possible is very important. We talk about that all the time. Routine helps to alleviate anxiety for people because our routine is expected and it's familiar and it adds structure to our lives. Holidays can disrupt that, which can be challenging for people with Alzheimer's and dementia, as well as for people in general. I think one of the reasons that we see the same holiday movies, classics on television every year around the time of the year is because it also brings a comfort to people. When you see something familiar, you know what to expect. So for people with dementia and Alzheimer's, it's very important, again, to try to stick to routines as closely as possible. And if there are changes in the holidays, for example, we talked about decorations, maybe introduce them gradually. Don't bring in everything all at once so as to try to reduce stress and keep things a little bit more consistent. Now, another thing uh, that people really don't talk enough about, I think, and this is important in the time after COVID because during COVID we were not traveling and a lot of people now are wanting to travel again and see family and perhaps also travel with someone who may be their care recipient. And this is becoming increasingly common and I'm seeing a lot of um, articles and things about traveling with people with Alzheimer's and dementia, but there aren't as many resources out there that I thought were as helpful as I would have liked. Um, I actually found out that the AARP had, uh, and I got so excited, a list of Alzheimer's and dementia friendly hotels. But I came to find reading that list that it just, um, it's a lot of the same tips that we're gonna talk about today, but there isn't actually a hotel chain that provides a partnership, for example, with the Alzheimer's Association or a wandering service. And what an amazing idea that would be. So traveling with someone with Alzheimer's and dementia can create additional stress, but it can also require some extra planning to ensure everyone's safety. So there are some general travel considerations that you may wanna think about because environmental changes can trigger wandering or confusion, anxiety, agitation. So if you are considering traveling even by car with someone, enroll in a wandering response service. And we have this linked here and the number uh, for those who may be joining us by phone, 1-800-272-3900. The uh, service that is provided by the Medic Alert Foundation through the Alzheimer's Association. And we'll be sharing this resource uh, after our program today. Another thing is that there are some very sophisticated GPS tracking devices for people who wander. Um, some of them though are very expensive and even require a monthly subscription. So it's not just a one-time purchase. Um, but they can be very helpful and potentially worthy investments if you need them. Some can even connect you to that person by voice or video, depending on the device that you might get for them. So we have a link here um, to a number of these different devices. Uh, if you want to go with something that's a little bit more simple, many of you have perhaps seen the tile 
which is very commonly used now for luggage, but it can also be attached to someone's shoe or in a pocket. And it's another option that can be helpful and very inexpensive to help track someone. The difference between these uh, devices is that GPS uses a more precise um, uh, service location, whereas these tiles use Bluetooth. They're much simpler to set up as well. So these are some ideas. In addition, think about how you're going to be traveling. Um, are you going to be traveling by car? Are you going to be flying? Um, again, something that we talk about when we discuss evacuating for storms is that you want to look for hotels that have inside corridors, inside hallways. It makes it much safer for someone who wanders as opposed to hotels with doors that open to the outside because they're often um, not uh, monitored in the same way and they have obviously more uh, ability to get out of the room and to wander. So think about that. And also, um, based upon the person's sleep pattern, you probably know what time of day is best for that person. And it's something to consider, um, both in terms of uh, car travel, but also for flight times. Um, you know, many flights, uh, people take red eye flights and wake up very, very early to catch them. That might not be ideal for someone who has Alzheimer's or dementia. So think about that. Um, you know, we always say, you know, your care recipient best. So that is something that you want to consider too. And I did see that we have um, uh, two comments. Eric said, please put in the chat, you're saying express gratitude up. Um, and I see the snapshot of that. Thank you. Um, as I said, we will be sending out a copy of that to everyone. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit more about air travel because again, this is um, something that is very important Many people don't recognize that actually working with a travel agency uh, or working with the airline directly is much more advantageous than looking to book something online with Orbitz or Expedia because notes that you might put in for um, wheelchair reservations or um, assistance, they don't always transfer. So um, it is important that if you do book with an online travel service for a flight, that you still then call the airline to make sure that they have the notes about disability assistance if you included them. Um, a lot of people who book with sites like Orbitz and Expedia will get to the airport and find out that their notes never transferred over. So um, that is a very important one. It's much easier to travel when you have accommodation and assistance. Another thing too is that uh, airplanes have a lot of distractions because there are a lot of people. So try to book seats at, as close to the front of the plane as possible because there are fewer distractions. And it's also important to remember that when you're traveling, uh, announcements on loudspeaker systems at the airport or even within the plane when the captain is speaking, it can be very confusing or startling to people as can crying babies and other things in the environment that we don't have control over. So if your care recipient has something that makes them feel calm, uh, it could be a scented hand lotion, it can be um, a scarf, um, anything at all, try to keep these things with you to help use them as a way to redirect and to distract. It's the best tactic, we know that, redirect and distract. So if walking is difficult, oh, please go ahead, Evelyn. What about a mask? I'm gonna talk about that too. Yes. Um, <laughs> so um, I just wanted to go over some of the, the basics for travel because um, there are a lot of things that people don't consider. And um, I actually did a lot of research um, looking at a lot of different organizations and seeing what their advice is also from um, the TSA. So. Um, it is recommended, even if your care recipient is mobile, um, that you still get wheelchair assistance because it will make navigating through the airport a lot easier. And if you have the opportunity to fly direct and not have stopovers, that is also recommended. Even if the passenger doesn't require support for mobility, the reason this is helpful is because it can help get you through those airport security checkpoints much more easily. And the support can also help to expedite the process, reduce stress, 
uh, waiting in lines. Mm -hmm. When you are at the airport, ask the TSA security agent at the security checkpoint. Tell them about your care recipient and ask if you're permitted to assist them. It's also important for that reason that you register with the airline. And don't hesitate to ask for assistance from airport employees and also from in-flight crew. Now, if the person needs help, as an example, using the bathroom, you might want to look for companion care bathrooms at the airport. Bathrooms on airplanes often don't have much space for two people. So consider a plan if you are bringing your care recipient with you. For example, you might want to be able to take them to the bathroom or even consider using an adult diaper or taper down on fluids ahead of the flight. And alternatively, if you're flying alone with your care recipient, see if you can perhaps travel with an additional travel companion. It can be very challenging if you have to go to the restroom and you don't have someone to look after your care recipient, as an example. So that, that is an additional stress. And um, of course, stay with your travel companion at all times. And that's why having another person there will make that much easier. The Alzheimer's Association has some additional tips for air travel that I thought were um, interesting. To include all emergency contacts with your airline reservation, and also to contact TSA to determine if a pass can be issued to family members or friends to help escort the person through the terminal with you. So there is a number actually for this, and I'm going to give it to you. Um, it's called TSA CARES, and that's their number at 855-787-2227. Now, you do have to call them at least three days ahead and tell them that you are traveling with someone with Alzheimer's or dementia. Also, make sure that all travel documents are identifiable and readily accessible. It may be helpful for the person to have a document holder as well or for you. And have a bag of essentials with you at all times that includes medications, a change of clothes, water, snacks and activities to help redirect and distract. And Evelyn, you asked a good question about masks. Right now, masks are not mandated, but it is my opinion that for those who are older and those who have chronic health issues, when you are in an enclosed space with other people for long periods of time, like a flight, wear an N95 mask. Even if you're boosted, um, I know that the current COVID strains are not as virulent as the previous ones, but they're extremely contagious. Um, I am gonna be traveling to a conference, I said, at the beginning of our program next week. I have a small um, uh, TSA approved bottle of Lysol that I bring with me and I spray everything down on the plane. And I do also wear an N95 mask and I don't care how people look at me or what they think, but it's how I feel safer for travel. And I think that when you're with older people who have perhaps health issues, that is a very important consideration. We need to keep practicing washing our hands, using sanitizer, and also when we're with family, considering that as well, and potentially being outside as opposed to indoor, and asking perhaps that other people take some precautions ahead of us all being together too. I know that that's a lot, so I wanted to pause here and see if anyone has any questions or comments. So if you're on the phone, please press star six. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you're on Zoom, you can just unmute yourself, put your hand up, go to the chat room. We'd love to hear from you. These, this has been fabulous information, Elliot. Just Awesome. So, so many glad. ideas. Yeah. And I had no idea about TSA cares. That's wonderful. So if you are traveling with anyone that needs assistance, um, it could be a physical disability or Alzheimer's or dementia, you can call them three days ahead and they will help um, to make that process of travel much more easy for you. I thought it was an oxymoron when you said it. <laughs> right. But it, it, and, I, and I actually called the number and it works. Okay. I, you know how many of the numbers don't. And I, I, I actually didn't believe that there was a number to reach someone at TSA, but I was, I was pleasantly in, uh, surprised. So cool. So if you are traveling and if you're going to be visiting with family or friends, 
Uh, as Lucy said earlier, you know, it can be important to educate other people about what your uh, care recipient is going through. Um, the caregiver that I was speaking with yesterday, her father has, a, has advanced Alzheimer's and he gets very aggressive and agitated. And she has to explain this to anyone that comes into the home because they can sometimes not take very well to that. But, you know, this is a part of his illness. And it's important to go over any special needs that might be uh, something that you would like, for example, from others who might be coming to visit you or spending time with all of you. Um, for example, if loud noises bother your loved one, you might want to let people know. The very, very important thing is to recognize that we all need a lot of time for rest. So don't overschedule, don't overcommit. Be realistic about abilities and limitations, not only for your care recipient, but for yourself. You might want to also buffer extra time when scheduling activities. And it might be helpful to stay as close to your normal routine as possible. We keep saying that. Try to keep meal times and bedtime at a similar schedule as what you do at home. And eating at home, as an example, too, might be a better choice than going to a crowded restaurant with someone. So when I travel, um, I know that my digestive system is certainly can be impacted. And I know that that's true for a lot of people. Um, traveler's diarrhea and traveler's constipation are not just jokes. They really do exist. And for people with Alzheimer's and dementia, this becomes heightened. So it is very important to keep this in mind and try to keep meal times water intake, accessible snacks that have high fiber and things accessible and available. Um, it's very important around the holidays too because we tend to eat more sweets and more food in general. So it is important just to keep these things in mind if you're traveling with someone. Well, thank you for that, Elliot. And I hope, uh, our, I hope that Bonnie who wrote us uh, the email took note of all those wonderful things that you, all those things that you said would be extremely helpful. I'm going to read it out for those who are, might be on the phone. And we received this email. My name is Bonnie. I'm 68 and a full-time caregiver to my mother, who is 90 and has Alzheimer's. We live together in an apartment in Florida. My brother and his family still live in Atlanta where we are all from, and he is insistent that my mother and I come to visit for Christmas this year. Much as I would love to, I can't even imagine the task of having to pack for both of us and to travel the distance, either by car or plane. Either option seems hard. I'm worried about my mother's agitation and that the visit will disrupt her routine and comfort. I'm having a hard time with this decision and with speaking to my brother about my feelings. Part of me feels guilty, like I'm taking the, holiday, taking the holidays away from my mother and my brother and his children and getting to see her. I don't have, I don't, I have enough room in my apartment for his whole family to come and visit um, us here. Logically, I know this is the best decision for my mother and I, but I have a hard time with the guilt I'm feeling and how to share this with my brother. And that guilt comes in again, right, caregivers? The guilt that we feel. Well, I have to tell you, Bonnie, that I could certainly understand how you're feeling. It really sounds like an overwhelming task to even think about flying or driving. So what I wanna say to you that it's okay to say no, all right? Please communicate to your brother all that you wrote in your email to us. Tell him about your concerns for your mother's welfare as well as for your own. He needs to know that, your, that his mother can get very agitated and explain what that agitation really means. What is her behavior like? Maybe it's disruptive. Does she get upset? Does she get sad? We keep asking and telling you that it's important to communicate to family members that you trust and even friends of what's going on. And really, and ask him to please understand that you're not in a position to make this trip with your mother due to her condition. Now, 
if he's willing to come and pick you guys up, bring you back to his house, or bring you then back home, maybe, as long as you both understand what it means. I, I don't know how far Atlanta is from Florida, uh, what it means to travel uh, by car, all the things that Elliot mentioned, bathroom, um, noise, um, lots of people being disoriented. So I think that it's time to be really, really honest with him. And I hope that he will understand. You can FaceTime um, or Zoom. This is how many people celebrated holidays together during COVID. There are tablets, not just for video calls. This can be a great gift idea for, for the holidays for all of you. So we said before that perspective, you know, perspective is important. Many people outside of the immediate caregivers don't realize the demands of the role of what you're going through on a daily basis. You know, it's really time to have a heart to heart talk with your brother and hopefully he will understand that this might not be an easy thing to do uh, this particular holiday. Now, the other thing is that holidays can be a good time, as I said, to share communication and to share your own wish list with others in your family. It can also be helpful for you to let others know what you need. And in Christmas, we give each other presents. And this might be some presents that you would like to ask for. And one of them could be respite. Some caregivers ask for time off from caregiving duties as a gift for the holidays. I think it's a great idea. This could mean another family member gives you a break, sometimes asking for a Saturday off, um, you know, in the next three months is more accepted as family mer members can, you know, they can reschedule their calendars as well. If this is not possible, perhaps they could consider paying for a home care worker or to stay at a respite facility. Um, and I'm going to just give you, we always talk about 211. It's a wonderful uh, resource to call to connect with your triple A's and to see what might be available in your area. So these are gifts that you, you know, you can ask for. Now, the other thing could be home repairs, like light uh, bulbs need changing. That would be a great one for me. Or grab bars need uh, installation. Um, the madding pile of junk in the garage needs to go to the dump. Tess says that these may be the perfect way for a family member to help out if uh, providing personal care is too uncomfortable for them. So that goes back to communication. Express that you have enough sweaters, you have enough ties. Uh, this is something that you would really appreciate. Care for you. How about a gift certificate for a massage? a facial or a manicure? How about an opportunity to spend the day walking in the outdoors or going to a show? <laughs> so these are things that you know that um, you have to give yourself permission to ask. But I also want to talk about while caregiving, it's easy to get caught up in all the tasks of personal care and homemaking chores make a point of setting some time aside this holiday season to enjoy the person you're caring for uh, in a relaxed one-on-one -on -one content. Now, we talk a lot about that, that it's so important not to have just caregiving tasks with the person you're caring for, but to have some really nice personal time with them. You know, some of the best activities are those which say, you know, take advantage of their long-term memory Hey, reminiscing, we talk about that, uh, looking through photos, unpacking holiday decorations, which may be um, lots of memories that go with it. Now, music is a wonderful way to connect. So do something special with your loved one this holiday, whether it's, as I said, putting on some wonderful Christmas music. If they're able to have a little dance, you know, have maybe a special little event, have a little coffee time or tea time. And also reflect on the rewards. Reflecting on the rewards of caregiving can help maintain your self-esteem. 
it may feel very rewarding to know that you are fulfilling a vow or a promise you made to the person for whom you are providing care. Your caregiver may be an expression of living up to your personal ideals or religious beliefs. You may also be experiencing a great deal of growth as you learn new skills and meet challenges in ways you never imagined possible. You know, so this is kind of what we're actually saying is like stay in the moment, make new memories. What was, was. We can go back. And the thing is that the positivity part, and I'm going to share this again, one of the nicest activities I did with my mom, who I was a caregiver for over 10 years, was doing her nails. Um, she chose that you bring the colors, she would choose the colors, we'd sit, we'd reminisce. And I have to say, it connected me back to the mom that I knew for an hour, an hour and a half. And those memories are lasting forever. So I was wondering if anybody would like to share what activities would you like to do for this holiday on a personal level with the person that you're caring for? If you're on the phone, press star six. Otherwise, unmute yourself, go on chat, put your hand up. We really would love to hear from you. I'm sure if you've listened to any of our podcasts, you realize that, you know, when we hear from caregivers, it's it's so interesting. It's so appropriate um, to the topic and for other caregivers. So please join us. Lucy, I think how you framed what you were saying um, to me sounded like such a beautiful gift really for the holidays is the creation of these memories that you have with you forever. And also taking pause to really appreciate um, these things. Um, I think for many people who are also working, this is a time of the year when you have a little bit of a break and it's a really ideal time to be able to take stock and enjoy those moments and those experiences that you have. And I keep hearkening back to, we had a gentleman on one of our calls who talked about the first list you should make every day is your self-care list. I love that. Well, that's why I said the most important thing is, you know, your self-care. That should be the priority. It's not being selfish when you look at it in that perspective. Mm -hmm. It's being smart, knowing that you can take care of yourself, you have someone else to take care of, and deal with your emotions. And Elliot and I are always saying, acknowledge your emotions. Whatever you're feeling, it's okay. As Bonnie said, you know, she was feeling guilty. Understand why. It's okay. It's okay that you're feeling guilty. Acknowledge it. But then look at why are you feeling guilty and the realization and the reality that this might be an impossible trip to take. And those holidays certainly do trigger that guilt, don't they? We feel a sense of uh, onus or responsibility to having to do things or the, the could and the should, as I say, and those two words raise everyone's blood pressure. So. <laughs> I, I think, Lucy, again, the way that you framed um, making the holidays about these special moments and memories and taking time to reflect and appreciate that, I think, is a really great takeaway. I, um, I, I, as I said earlier, I can't believe how quickly the year has flown by and all the more reason to take pause at some point in the year to just sort of appreciate what we have in the relationships in our lives and and what we do get out of our experience of caring for someone else. So with that, um, I am going to say happy holidays to everyone. And we have some resources here as always. And as I said, we will be sharing a copy of our um, slides. But that wandering response service is a very important one. If you do have someone that you're providing care for, and you haven't already registered them in a wandering response service, please do so, it's free. And uh, as I said, it's through um, Medical Alert via the Alzheimer's Association. And they also, by the way, have, um, I had talked about those GPS and tile trackers for people. Uh, they also have through the Wandering Response Service, a number of different 
devices that they can help go over with you too. Um, I was very surprised to see what a range now with today's technology there are in these type of tracking devices um, and, and also the cost. So some of them can be deferred through Medicare and um, you can find out more about that through the Alzheimer's Association Medic Alert Wandering Response Service. And I, please, Lucy, go ahead. I was just saying, um, so you, you're showing this wonderful slide um, that is exactly where I live. <laughs> yeah. And uh, lots of snow coming our way. I, I prefer Evelyn's background. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was telling Evelyn that before. Yes. yes, I also want to wish everybody a very, very happy holiday. So before we hand it over to Evelyn with some announcements, we wanted to ask if anyone has any last questions or comments. And again, remember after the hour, we will be staying on for an unrecorded, anonymous, open discussion. If you're on the phone, press star six. We'd love to hear from you. If you're on Zoom, you know what to do. Any last comments? I did want to share earlier, Joanne had shared uh, in the chat that she had a caregiver who lost his wife once, and he promoted making a card to give to others that his wife has memory problems and be patient with them. Um, had to take her to the men's room on occasion, and the person should also have name and emergency number on them at all times. And I had said that that's a really great idea. That is something I had seen on the Alzheimer's Association website that idea of creating like um, almost like a nameplate with a lanyard around the person's neck for when you travel with them through the airport. Um, and that might be something to consider, certainly. Great. Well, thank you guys so much. A lot of really good information, really good, you know, emotional kind of up. Um, appreciate that. And I want to say to all of our participants, that you will get those resources with your post-session questionnaire. However, you have to be registered. And sometimes people get the number from another person or get the Zoom link from another person. So if you aren't registered, please call our um, customer service representative at 866-390-6491. That's 866-390-6491. And you will be lucky enough then to get the monthly calendar, which is chock full of really good stuff this month. We have, you know, like today was emotions. We, we have Dr. Tam talking about Alzheimer's. I'm sure she'll get some questions about the holidays. We have what you need to know about medication, benefits and risks. And that's with Lucy on November 8th. Let's see, it's tomorrow, no, it's, uh, yeah, November 8th, tomorrow. And then Friday, we have how to celebrate when you are a caregiver, and that will be in Spanish. So that'll be on Friday. On Monday, we have caregiving in the holidays, and that was really about how to do your holiday calendar and make sure that you don't put too much in there, you know, and what, what are the important things to think about? We've got managing holiday stress with our zero psychiatrist. We have, well, who decides when I can't with an attorney? Um, we also have oh, the one I'm doing on that. It's actually the 27th, not the 28th, sorry. Create a plan to feel secure about your future. And that's all about care planning. And then Wednesday, November 29th, I love you. I don't want to hurt you with Dr. Oliver who has her dad living with her and who's, you know, really very well versed in the problems of, you know, elder abuse, um, having, having been through so much training herself. So with that, I want to thank you all. Oh, don't forget about the um, Caregiver Summit. And that is, is that Saturday? Today is the, today is the, right, it's the 10th. It's the 9th. So it is... Thursday. Friday. It's Friday? Uh, today is the 7th, sorry. So so it'll be the Thursday, right? <laughs> Thursday the 9th. 
And that's from 10 to 1 a.m. Central Time. And you can sign up for that and you can use your smartphone, computer, tablet. You can call in their in-person locations. You can get CEUs. And it, that one will be in English on November 9th. And then on November 16th, there will be another one totally in Spanish. And both of these have very famous people who will be addressing the issues of finding balance in your journey. So got a lot of stuff going on. Thank you all so much. I'm going to stop the recording and Elliot and Lucy will stay on as they mentioned. And so I want to wish you all um, happy planning for your holidays. Thanks Thank so you much, so Evelyn. Thanks, Evelyn. Thank you.